All right, Al, take it away. Okay, I was expecting a few more younger folks, and so I've got a presentation kind of directed a little simpler, but this will be fun. I want to start by reminding uh, just a happy birthday for dad. I guess we're a couple of days away. It'd be 94, and I realize that's just 30 years ahead of me. I was thinking of him as I walked past the little name box in the temple the other day. And I thought, why would he come to mind when I'm thinking of people to pray for? And I thought, if he's going through any stresses up there, it's probably because he sees what we're doing. So I did put his name in, thinking, you know, if there's anything that's on his mind that he'd like the rest of us to kind of work more on, uh, that's, that's probably important. But it's good to think of Dad. Um, the suggestion was talk about travel a little bit, partly because we abandoned uh, Las Vegas for a number of weeks and had a little fun, but also because Greece is a place that a few people have been to, and so we'll put a little focus on that. Uh, when I got off my mission and Mike and I went to Hawaii, there was an assumption that both of us were kind of looking to tap into the Japanese travel market. And I stayed in that realm for a few years, and that uh, kept us going until Marie got born, and he only wanted me to do something more serious and get to college. So I went to BYU to study journalism, and that lasted about a semester until I took a course on U.S.-Japan relations and realized I could mix international travel and reporting on what's going on in the world into kind of a government diplomatic career. And that's where uh, my current line of work broke off or started. Anyway, it's kind of fun to mix travel into, into life. And I think it's, it's therapeutic. I think we should all think about it. Today, our focus is a little bit on foreign travel, but travel doesn't necessarily have to be far away to be meaningful. I often think of John Squire just cruising around the back streets and dirt roads of, of middle, kind of central Utah and think that's, that's travel in a certain sense that I actually envy. But today we're going to talk a little more about the Eastern Mediterranean. So let's try and share here. Is that coming through okay? We'll play with we'll play with PowerPoint here for a minute. To begin with, I wanted to, to think of a number of things. I don't want to start a discussion. We'll have this discussion more towards the end. And in fact, I'll bring up this same slide here again at the end. But um, just a few overall ideas about travel. First here is why. I think the human spirit needs a little change of scenery. I think we're always trying to discover. I know that when I travel, you don't necessarily have to go very far to find something you hadn't noticed before. In certain ways, it's kind of like reading the Book of Mormon. There's reason to, to cover the same territory even again. It's fun to go into a new culture where you're looking back at yourself through a different lens and, and trying to figure out, well, What's been normal for me all my life is, is rather different for somebody else. What can I learn from that? And of course, there's family and memories and, and all kinds of other things. Something we might not think about as much uh, as why would we go on a trip is how do you travel? I think each of us has our own approach to things, our own style. Uh, are we explorers looking for new things? Or are we kind of, you know, Keep it convenient and show me what I want to see. And okay, I saw it. I'm done now. Can I go back to my warm hotel, or or uh, do I want to explore a little bit around the edges of what I'm seeing? How much planning do you require? How much stress does it create if you're in a situation where uh, you you really don't have your plan set for tomorrow? And there's some variables why that might make sense. Like you're in a city where you haven't yet decided if there's more to see here. You really have to go out and see the city for a couple hours to realize if there's another morning's worth of things to do in that city before you move on. Uh, are you comfortable with that? Or do you kind of have to have your movements figured out? 
On this trip, we did a lot of train travel and therefore uh, it was much more flexible than air travel. You not only did not have the downtime of airports than they involve, but uh, in most cities around Europe, if you miss a train at 6 a.m., there's another one at seven, or at least there's one by nine or 10. And so you can kind of roll with the punches a little bit easier and, and move around. But, but in your travel, how much needs to be set in stone and how much can, can you uh, kind of go by the seat of your pants? Um, one question is, is how early will Hiromi come up with the big idea for what she wants to do tomorrow? And you can't, you can't kind of plan beyond that. So we tended to be, uh, had hotels a day or two ahead of us, but, but not much longer than that. How do you spend money? Sometimes travel convinces us to pull out our wallets and not be quite as miserly. On the other hand, probably most of us are usually looking for a good deal. And then the idea about creature comforts. Some people travel and the quality of the restaurant is the highlight of wherever they go. I had one friend when I, I thought about going to Rome, he gave me this elaborate description of how to Uber my way to a couple of restaurants on the other side of town. And, and he didn't talk about anything else. Like, that's the way he travels. Where do those fit in? How much stuff do you have to carry? Another question, of course, is cost. And this is something that the younger generation uh, may think about more than we do sometimes. But cost really depends on the style of your travel. You don't have to wait to look into a trip to have a lot of money in the bank. You can find cheap flights. There are a lot of apps with hotels that you can get for reasonable prices. And I have found there in the middle of that list, if you immerse yourself in the local experience to some degree, it doesn't tend to cost as much. You're eating local, you're sharing local experiences. If you take the big tours and have less immersive experience, yeah, you're going to spend some money. You're going to be caught in tourist traps quite a bit more often. In my view, a cruise, while it has its reasons, and there are a lot of positives, um, it is the low end of immersion into any place that you visit. You, you go look and you run, you run back and hide back in your cocoon. And to me, there's a lot of experience that uh, needs a different type of approach. One way I found that was cheap travel, you get into a place like Athens, you go pick up a few travel brochures. Of course, you've already done your research, so you have some sense of what you want to do. But where does an actual tour take you for 80 bucks? Well three different places. I can walk and get to those three places in about as much time as, as they could give it to me. And having been on enough tours, you realize unless you have a truly uh, competent or a truly uh, brilliant guide, you can show yourself a lot of things. Just figure out what it is that's worth seeing and go see it. Walking makes a big difference in your expenses. It's kind of nice if you don't have to involve taxis. We had to I guess we had to involve taxis twice. Once was to get from home to the airport, an Uber, and once was to get in the middle of the night to the airport in, in Athens. Other than that, we found cheaper ways to get around, including, including local, oh, it only reminds me that, yeah, we had a little mess up at Auschwitz. We, our bus didn't come pick us up. We had to pay quite a bit for a taxi to get out there. And then eating makes a big difference. One question I've always had for travel since I was a tour guide in, in Hawaii is, are there kids that are too young to really travel and get most much out of it? And my answer was yes. 12 was about my cutoff for being worth taking a kid into a foreign culture. I have rethought that a little bit if I watched Marie take uh, her kids around because they engage at a level that's kind of beyond their age. And uh, should you travel before you get too old? It's, it's very painful to me to see handicapped folks trying to, handicapped due to age, trying to work their way up and down uh, some ancient ruins. And you realize, you know, the golden age for their travel was probably 10 years ago. It's good to make use of that while you can. And then there's a season of travel. Uh, for most of our lives, one way or another, school gets in the way. And the school schedule kind of defines when we're free. It's kind of be nice to be freed up from that when you can go in either October or March when you're in the transition of seasons, things are less hot and a, and a bit less crowded. Although on this trip, we realize just how crowded everything is anyway. And then having some sense of purpose of why you're going, because if you really know 
you're going somewhere you want to go for a specific reason. In our case, Greece was both the antiquities and family get together. Uh, it justifies the cost and it makes the whole thing easier to plan. And of course, uh, this is one of the reasons that makes travel all kinds of fun. We had some pretty decent cousin bonding on trains and in airports where we were stuck for a very long period of time. And then the, the uh, two little ones met in Frankfurt or met in at Eric's house later on. That makes travel all kinds of fun. And, I, and it made me rethink a little bit uh, taking kids on trips because if you adapt to their needs, you can have just as much fun. All right, one thing I wanted to point out, which is kind of obvious, is in certain parts of the world, history piles up on top of itself. You've got Greek influences, you've got extremely large areas of Roman influences, they're down across the Mediterranean as well. Islam is all over certain parts of Europe and it goes well beyond uh, what this graphic here shows. The Crusaders have left quite a bit in certain places, especially over on the, the uh, Mediterranean coast of Israel. That's rather fascinating. I, I explored the city of Akko, which is Acre, ancient Acre. A um, lot of cool history there. Byzantines come in, then the Ottomans come in. Napoleon came over this far and messed around the same regions, not up in Greece that I'm aware of, but down in e Egypt, and he tried to get to Syria and didn't make it. And the British came in and did their bit. And as you're visiting some of these places, you're seeing bits and pieces of all of this, uh, all of these elements of history. And that's what makes it fairly rich. So you can see some landscapes, and okay, you've got the scrub trees, kind of a Middle Eastern look of sorts. Greece itself is kind of a rocky place. And uh, this is the scene you might see until you get out your archeological shovel and dig a little bit. And then you realize so much history has passed through so many areas here that whether you know it or not, uh, you're walking on antiquities. There's a lot of this kind of thing around Jerusalem. Uh, my guess is uh, there's a whole lot yet to be discovered, especially down around the city of David, but there's tunnels underneath Jerusalem and that sort of thing. That, and then Turkey is just so wide open. That there are a lot of areas where they just haven't had time or resource to dig underneath. And many, a town has since built up on top and they can't dig. But there's just a lot of history. There's so much to see that I won't bore you with details on this, but we took our time getting there. We flew into Frankfurt and then we had a rail pass. And it was our goal to kind of see the Eastern areas of Europe. And that's how we made our two week circle to get back to where we started and timed that so that we'd be there for a family event. Mia was baptized. And then this group all got on airplanes to go down to Greece. When we got to Greece, which was delayed by about 11 hours because of the flights, it was the middle of the night, but Hugh worked some magic and got us on the first flight the next morning down to Santorini, where we flew down. Beautiful island. Um, Sarah and Dan actually spent probably more time than we did here. They, they visited more spots, and we'll get to that in a minute when we look at a map of, of Santorini. But that was a fun stop, and it's these blue domes and kind of the architecture that makes it exciting, as well as the sunsets. Our next move was up to Mykonos, which they call the party island. We took a ferry. Uh, it, it's fairly picturesque. It was a little chilly, but I think one of the reasons Marie made sure this fit in our itinerary was because it was a short ferry hop away from the island of Delos, which was the ancient center of the Delian League uh, where they kept the treasury. And there is literally an abandoned island that has more antiquities than you can even imagine. It's literally littered is a good word. Here's an island where you can just stumble over this stuff all day long. And that treasury that used to be here eventually got transferred over to Athens, and that's where the Parthenon uh, got funded. So from there, we took a ferry back to Athens. So let's talk about Greece for just a minute. 
this is kind of a crappy graphic, but in my view, you're kind of looking at the first Olympic Games just after 800 AD, I think it was 776 BC, uh, to about 300, where is the period that left a lot of the things that we're looking at. A slightly more detailed timeline, you got the Olympic Games. This is kind of a cool name here, Marathon. Brian actually used to work near Marathon and was able to drive over and watch them run the marathon from Marathon, which is kind of cool. Um, if you consider antiquities here back in the 400s BC, uh, who was the major enemy for Greece? It was clearly the Persians. And that's part of why they had to have the Delian League to bring all these city-states together to fight against the Persians. So that'll be reflected in some of the things you'll find there. Then you move forward to the Peloponnesian Wars, which were not uh, with the Persians, but between essentially Athens and Sparta, even though they ranged in naval battles all over the region. It's about that time when Pericles comes along. He seems to be the one who moved the treasury over to Athens and started the building programs that have left the things that we enjoy these days. So he's a big figure in local society, partly because Thucydides, who wrote the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, thought so highly of him that he's left with quite a reputation. Moving into kind of towards the 300s BC, when after the Peloponnesian Wars, democracy is restored, you get into the era of the philosophers, and then you get to Alexander the Great. And these tend to be the uh, historical events that left behind what people go to explore today. I also think it's fun to realize how much of the New Testament played out in this region. And here you have to extend a little beyond Greece to the regions around. But I got a kick out of right next to the Parthenon is Mars Hill, where Paul stood and, and gave some fairly basic reminders about the nature of God and the character of God. And I think this is in Acts 17. Uh, I got a kick out of seeing things like that. And then you've got, of course, some of the books of the, the uh, New Testament. Romans is nearby, Corinthians, Thessalonians, they're in Greece. Ephesians are Greek-influenced parts of Turkey. Ephesus is one of the best uh, old cities to visit because so much of it is still visible and it's reasonably uh, well maintained in, in archaeological terms, but you, you see a whole city instead of bits and pieces. You got the Galatians were over there, it's a little town called Colossae that was Colossians, not much left there to look at. Then you've got other things, uh, other names that are mentioned in the New Testament Kind of like, uh, I believe one of the epistles has a shout out to say hello to my friends in Hierapolis. That's a place that had a real cool uh, set of antiquities, including this, this nice theater. Cappadocia is mentioned in the New Testament. It also talks about per Pergamos. Uh, the, one of the best museums in Berlin is the Pergamon Museum, which comes from the antiquities they basically looted from Pergamon here and took it over to Britain. But that actually is, is one of the seven churches of Asia that are re, uh, addressed in the book of Revelation. So these are all in Turkey, essentially, the Asia side of Turkey. Uh, but they're another reason why this Greek influenced part of the world is fascinating to visit. And speaking of the New Testament, I also think it's fun to think about. Saul of Tarsus, who had his experience on the road to Damascus, that basically uh, gave us our best traveling uh, missionary in that entire region. And then you have the incident that Peter had in Joppa, where he saw the vision of the animals that led to taking the gospel beyond the Jews to the Gentiles that kind of enabled the spreading of the gospel up into all the other areas. Joppa was the, the only part of Tel Aviv that was really very exciting to visit, but it was an interesting little corner of the world. 
Okay. Greece, by the way, is where our family met, spent a week, and then they left. Uh, Hiromi and I were not done yet. So we took a little trip over to Corinth, and we took a bus and went up to Bulgaria to see what Sofia was all about. Had a rather wild bus day to get over to Istanbul. Uh, a few crazy memories there. We flew down to Izmir so that we could go to Ephesus. Took buses to a few places down here. Took an overnight bus back. When that was over, we flew down to Israel and spent, uh, she spent three days. I spent about eight days while she went off to Cairo. Anyway, that was kind of our trip. The, the Greeks portion of this, just to give a little bit of flavor, one of my approaches to a place like this is try and figure out what are the main things to see and then thread the needle between them, kind of walk between them and find other stuff. So I kind of get a kick out of the Parthenon, which is so visible from all around that part of Athens. You visit it, and before and after visiting, you walk all around it, and you see it from different angles. And you get up to some vantage points where you can see all the way out to the ocean. It's just a fun city in that sense, that it's very walkable, and the exciting things are very visible. These views are essentially, that's the Parthenon in the middle of that picture, looking down to the uh, port of Piraeus, which is the main port uh, heading out to the various islands. All right, now here's the hotel we stayed in. And that got wonderful reviews. It's actually an Airbnb that Marie found for us. We had the entire building, it was four floors. So each family kind of got a floor. And we were all near one another in the quirkiest environment you can imagine. This is a part of, of Athens that prides itself on street art. So there we were. Okay, I asked people who have been there, what, I, I hate to use the word, what was your favorite? Because it's hard to pick one. What's something you're really glad you did? So you can kind of get a flavor here. The Acropolis was kind of a main item for some people. Santorini got high marks. Islands generally got high marks. Delos, that was Mia who got a real kick out of Delos, partly because it was full of stray cats. That's another funny thing, to go through something so rich in history and have kids that want to chase the cats. I've, I've come to terms with that, and it's kind of fun. Um, Towards the bottom here, Eric's the one that said local Orthodox Easter procession. He kind of emphasized seeing what the locals do. We got caught up in an Easter procession where priests would hold a cross and march through the town and, uh, and uh, bands would come behind. It was very solemn, but fascinating. And the, the chanting and the bell ringing at the churches before and after were kind of fun. But getting swept up in that local event was one of the things that kind of brought life to the visit. All right, when one visits somewhere, another question that comes up besides what do you see is what do you eat? These were some of the ideas of fun things. My point here would be, it's not weird food. In other words, it's easy to enjoy food. It's not food you have to be worried about. Um, we're trying to invite some people to dinner tomorrow, and they said, well, we're not adventurous eaters. And I thought, well, okay, we're going to go out to a restaurant then. But there's a, a place like Athens, you don't need to be afraid that this is just going to be scary to know what to order. There's, there's all kinds of things, and the euro being a core one, that are just you can see them visually and choose them. And it's even with a language barrier, it's not hard to eat well and enjoy yourself. And Saganaki, I didn't remember what that was, but apparently it looks like this. That was Sylvie's choice. So food is part of the deal. Of course, ice cream fits in. This was kind of a cheese and meat spot. You can always find cheap breads anywhere you go. That's always fun. Ice cream is everywhere. And we had the benefit of someone who had overpurchased chocolates in Belgium. <laughs> and she had quite a stash that followed us through much of this tour. 
So now and again, the box would come out and everybody got another sample. We finally finished that before we had to put it on, carry it on an airplane again. So in thinking, and this, this is not just for Greece, this is kind of for anywhere. My approach to a visit is do a certain amount of research from various sources, figure out what are the key things. I, I really need to see this and this and this. And then you have kind of your second tier. If time uh, is available, I ought to see this and this. The context of how these all fit together and how many things you could see in kind of one morning. And that comes down to whether you're going to walk or use taxis or how you're going to go around. And now and again, a tour is a good idea because it gets you to the meat of the matter and then you move on. The problem with a tour is it drives right past everything in between. Um, some idea of, of other things to do without too much locking yourself in, I found useful. And again, the way we went around Europe, the trains enabled that flexibility in a very positive way. How to get around? To me, a good pair of shoes and a little bit of knowledge of public transport is as useful as uh, tour guides and tour buses most of the time. But those other options are all certainly available. Athens had good uh, tickets. You buy one ticket to seven different locations and you can use it over the course of a few days, it was, was kind of useful. Uh, again, getting back to the eating part, it's just easy. You don't have to worry too much. This is not, this is an exotic location that's not awkwardly exotic. Athens from Google Maps, if you took the concept I just suggested of coming up with some key sites, here's the Acropolis, the Parthenon right in the middle, and that's elevated on a hill. You've got the plaza where all the tourists gather and the markets and the, the uh, touristy souvenirs and everything. You'll pass through that point one way or another. That's kind of a sight to see. You climb up on another hill and you can see all the way to the ocean. And you can see on there the prison of Socrates is not far. It gives you wonderful views and some context here. You've got the uh, ancient Agora, which is worth strolling around. You've got the museum called the Acropolis Museum. When we first went to Greece back in 2006, we went to a national museum downtown that was not uh, terribly exciting, but they said this one was pretty good. I did not go, but a lot of the kids did, and they said it was great. Mars Hill is right there in that close area. People like to go to the changing of the guard and see the high-stepping Greek, sol the Greek uh, soldiers doing their little guard transition. And then the first modern Olympic games was in this stadium. So this is kind of the tourist port parts of Athens. If you were to try and walk from two of the farther away points within that range, according to Google Maps, it's gonna take you about 25 minutes to walk. Uh, bring families with strollers, you're gonna take longer. Bring hungry people, you're gonna take longer. Me by myself, that's about right. Um, point is, it's walkable. It's very doable. And in walking in between, you notice things that otherwise uh, the tour bus wouldn't have taken you to. They're all kinds of fun. From where we stayed in our hotel up north to the highest point with a good overlook, that's, that's a bit of a hike with some hills there. But Google Maps is pretty accurate in saying that an adult walking rather routinely could get there in less than a half hour. That's not bad. I wanted to go to Mars Hill to see the sunset. It's kind of a, a, a place where lovers sit and watch the sunset in the evening, but I figured it'd be a good advantage point as any. And he told me, thought, good grief, you're going to be gone all night. I said, no, I'll be there in 15 minutes. It took less. So very maneuverable on foot. And as you get tired, you just have to figure out the tram system a little bit. There's a subway system, there's buses, there's a a road top tram. Googling out just a little bit, there is a hill higher than the Acropolis. It's not too far away, or you look down on the Acropolis. It's kind of a neat vantage point. So your Acropolis is over there. You're looking out to the ocean again. You've got the uh, modern Olympic Stadium, which you can see from that view. So if you go a little bit beyond the core tourist areas, there, there is more to do here and there. 
But again, it's, it's very reachable. Greece is much more than Athens. A few things that uh, come to mind are the various islands, and there are any number you could choose from. I'll just show you the ones we went to, but first, a couple of things that uh, we thought about. Bry is the one that can tell you about this monastery, Meteora. In fact, Bry, you ought to come on and, and say a thing or two about that. Is Bry there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> why, why, why would one visit? Um, just for the unique architecture, for one thing. They were built up there for protection. And uh, there's more than one. There's two or three. One's still a working monastery you can, and as kind of a museum. So... It was just neat to go visit. And one of the monks spoke very good English and shared his Turkish delight with us. And it's just a lot of fun. There's a nunnery up there. So just uh, it was a good experience. A pretty area, unique mountain structures or formations. So, Bry, in many ways, had the advantage of living there and having a car. Once you have the mobility of a car, it opens up a lot of different options. For us, it came down to, do we want to spend a very long day, starting early in the morning until late at night, with kids, uh, and I think it was 125 bucks a person to get up there and back, and it was our last day, and so we opted out. But anyone who's been there, would probably tell you of all the things to see in Greece, that was their highlight. And then again, I mentioned that the Bry had actually worked over there by marathon. I'm thinking just for the name, that'd be fun to visit. But we thought about it, and part of it was we had kids that were a little tired and we, we stuck with Athens. You don't mean I did take a train over to Corinth? That canal is pretty cool to look at. Then you got the islands. Sarah and Dan, I think, love the islands. Here are some of them. Bry has been down to Crete. Bry said he took a car ferry down to Crete, so they had the car to fill up with goods from the, the military commissary down there. Of course, he was there not only with a car, but with the embassy. That kind of helps. Um, an, an interesting point here, besides the, the islands that we went to, Rhodes, that looks like it's way over part of Turkey, is actually part of Greece the border with Turkey, most of the islands, even though they're close to Turkey, uh, tend to be uh, Greek. The border is way over very near the coast. There's this little circle up near Athens where uh, you've got nearby islands. When Hiroma and I went the first time in 2006, we thought, well, we got to see a Greek island. Let's go find a cheap Greek island. And so we took a ferry couple of hours. It's probably this Aegina we went to, uh, swam in the ocean a little bit and, and came back. That was a fun visit because there at the port of Piraeus, uh, docked across the bay was the USS Cole. If anybody remembers, that's the one that got blown up in Yemen. And we traveled here when it had gone back to the US, been repaired and sent back into the region. And so I had a little flutter in my heart as I saw that back on duty uh, in the, the Eastern Mediterranean as part of us trying to fight whatever that war on terror was. All right, among these islands, Crete's the biggest. Like I say, Bryce said he went down there for uh, a commissary and probably looked around a little bit. Anything else you wanna say about that, Bryce? I don't remember a whole lot more about the island. We were, in, we were only there a couple of days. Well, you got ferries to everywhere here. Uh, probably the most uh, popular island is Santorini. So let's go to Santorini for a minute and see if Sarah wants to chime in here. If you look at the map, it's kind of on, on the left there. It's kind of this 
odd shape curvature. I believe that entire island is kind of the uh, volcanic cinder cone, and those are the elements that come up above the surface. We went to where the star is and where the uh, architecture is and spent a couple of nights there. It sounds like Sarah and Dan went around to some of these other little islands. Sarah, you want to add anything there? Yeah, we, because of our short planning time, we ended up just doing three days on Santorini. So we actually stayed at Kamari Beach right along the, on the far side, not on the volcano side, which was less populated, but we were literally right on the Black Sands Beach. It was gorgeous. And then we did a day trip that took us to Therasia, which I guess has what was it, like 300 inhabitants or something. And you, that's where I rode the donkey. <laughs> Dan walked up the cliff because it's just the, uh, what do they call it? The switchbacks up, but it was hot and I was tired and we were only halfway through the day. So I paid the $10 to ride the smelly donkey. <laughs> Uh, up the side and Dan walked and then we had a beautiful lunch though up at the top uh, with I mean the views are just incredible the, the water is so blue the sky I mean it was it was beautiful and then there's a little there's another small island that we stopped at uh, really right in the middle middle of the yeah. bay yes it's in it's right in the middle and it's uh, you just hike up to the crater where they're where we did, there are a couple of spots where it's still hot spots and there's steam coming out from the volcano uh, originally. So you just hike up to the crater and I mean, there's no people on it, but the government does charge you $5 or something equivalent to something to get on. But anyway, so we did that little hike and then, then there are some hot springs that they say are still hot from the volcano that we swam in. They weren't super hot, <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was warm, but. So that's what we did. It was just a day that we did around those smaller ones. And it was just nice to get, I mean, it's just not city stuff. I mean, you when you've only got 300 people on an island and 20 cars or something, I mean, it's this is small town. <laughs> that was real small town living, yeah. Yeah, you get a good feel for things. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, just a view, <clears throat> there's the north, uh, northern part of that island where that star is. Uh, that's one of the more popular places uh, on the island. That's where you see a lot of the views. I think that's where you guys are taking that picture right there, and it is spectacular. I mean, it's just breathtaking. So that was uh, <clears throat> extremely beautiful. And one fun thing that we did was to get around on the island. We rented a, a four wheeler, and uh, we were able to transport our luggage on that by wrapping it with a uh, bungee cord. Uh, and then we transported that to our hotel. We dropped it off there, and then it was great to be able to get around. It was very common to have either a little moped or a little four wheeler. And uh, we both bebopped around with yeah. that, and Sarah drove that. We drove that. We had a good time with that all over the island. Yeah. So that's about all. So we, I mean, that's why we, we were several days on Santorini, and so we got to see a lot of it, but it was, it was beautiful. So that raises a couple of good points. One of Sarah's uh, highlights she pointed out was going to elevated places where you can see a view. And she just talked about that. That applies to any travel anywhere, as far as I'm concerned. One of the first things to do when I go to a new place is try and get high, whether that's a building or a hill, and get your bearings. And then you kind of get a sense of how things fit and how much you can see uh, by walking between them and how much you're going to have to use other transport to get there. You can see the dotted lines for the ferries, which uh, there are many that come here, and a lot of yachts parked around the edges because it's beautiful. One of the highlights of Santorini is the sunsets. And if you notice again, that star up in the corner, there's a lot of island that's not up there. That's the, the sunset viewing area. So I was a, a little surprised. There were, there were probably 2,000 people watching this sunset from every corner you could imagine. It was kind of the busy time of day. And I thought, wow, this is a lot of hotels. And indeed it was, but then I discovered when the sunset was over, a number of these people filed back to get on buses to go back to their hotels on other parts of the island. And I realized that the sunset itself is an attraction enough that people would bus over simply for that. It was pretty cool. It was beautiful. 
Mykonos is called the party island. Um, somebody started a paradise beach club and that wasn't good enough. So somebody said, we're super paradise. And I'm sure there's a lot of drinking and that sort of thing. For us, it was basically uh, a little family time, two little places, one called, uh, what was it called? Little Venice. It's kind of a touristy spot. And then these, these windmills that are all lined up makes it sort of picturesque. But I believe one of the reasons Marie chose this is because the ferry over to the little island of Delos was available only from here. And it's about an hour on a terribly windy day. But again, you, you walk an island that is literally littered with antiquities. And that was a lot of fun. So that was sort of the islands. Um, here are the travel tips that our group and Sarah as well contributed to. We start with the group at the top. Just think through what you're gonna do. Sarah mentioned that they didn't feel like they had enough time to plan it well enough. With enough research, you may find that a different island kind of suits your needs. Uh, to me, a lot of the value of these islands is just they're very relaxing. They're just a place to unwind and, and, and see beautiful oceans. Sylvie's the one that said, don't spend too much uh, on food in the islands. We had gone there first and she said, oh, I have to try that, I have to try that, and then got to Athens, realized, oh, it's all the same stuff and it's a lot cheaper. The uh, children's suggestions in the blue off to the left there, Marie has done a very good job of that in her travels. And often they'll go to a museum that's, that's directed towards things kids like to do. And this was a trip where we had a couple of baby carriers in our group, and so, Luggage was a little unwieldy as we get on, on and off ferries, but if you've got a good baby carrier, it, it makes a lot of difference. There in the green was, was Eric's suggestion. Ask what locals do, find out what they eat, find out what's cool, learn a little bit about their life. And then the items at the bottom were generally associated with uh, some delays we had in Brussels. And one person who left a passport at the a security checkpoint and had to be called back on the intercom, to, luckily, so that they didn't travel on without it. I believe Marie is still trying to retrieve the uh, money the EU requires the airline compensate for such a delay. If she gets it, it'll pay back more than the airline cost, but it was a rather extended stay. Um, one thing I picked up off the internet about travel that I think applies, it is always nice to have money. <laughs> you can usually do with less clothes, but more money is nice. All right, there's just another picture of some of the main things in Athens. There's most of our group. We had a good collection of folks trying to enjoy it together. And again, we moved at a pace comfortable to the group. And so sometimes I would walk off and see something that I could tell they weren't gonna have time to go see and I'd come back in time to join them. So maybe I was the odd man out for some of these things, but in the end, everybody got to do what they wanted to do. Okay, a few suggestions for planning a trip. Uh, the photograph there applies to a couple of these suggestions. One is enjoy modern Greece as well as ancient Greece. Here you have a subway that runs right past the Agora. You just you're, you're watching these you're, you're going through these ancient sites and you hear this rumble of the subway coming underneath and i guess this could also apply to tri public transport although they do have strikes in that part of the world and if at all possible uh if you're going all the way to this part of the world turkey is worth the visit and it it merges culturally in many many ways <clears throat> In fact, we went on a food tour of Athens and the lady reminded us two or three times, our food is essentially gonna look a lot like Turkish food because we're all part of the same culture, even though they fight over Cyprus. Most of all, I would suggest when you go to somewhere with so many historical insights, just don't try to take it all in, you never will. However, 
um, you really feel like an idiot when you get back to the hotel and you realize I was within a block of that aqueduct and I didn't look around the corner to see it. So do enough research to know uh, in Acre, I missed an aqueduct, but I, I'm not I'm not sure I would have gone because it was just far enough that I would have had to walk. But uh, one of my favorite pictures of the Hijaz Railway in Saudi Arabia is a train that's kind of toppled over into the sand. It's just this iconic reminder of World War I and Lawrence of Arabia. I left Saudi Arabia and two years later realized I was within 50 yards of that one time and didn't know, so I didn't go around the corner to look at it. Allow for a little bit of serendipity. Um, Hiromi got a little tired of walking in the sun in Jaffa, Jaffa. And so she sat down to the shade and I went for a little walk and found a place that said, hey, this is where Simon the Tanner lived. Well, that's the, the Peter saw the vision uh, related to Cornelius and taking the gospel to the Gentiles. It also related to where uh, he raised Tabitha from the dead. And you have to be skeptical about anything in uh, Israel. It really happened right here. But you can be reasonably be confident that it fits the narrative, and it was probably somewhere in that area. I also, in going to Haifa, I didn't realize uh, really where Mount Carmel was until I was on it. So I, I spent much of a day and many miles of walking with Elijah and the prophets of Baal and, and got lost. <laughs> um, I've said this before, but tourists can really help you get a sense of the place. But boy, they miss a lot of good things. Um, I realized on those those seven churches in Asia, some of them don't have a lot to go look for, but the one Laodosia or whatever, however you pronounce that, if you look on Google, it's a rather complicated uh, set of ruins that looks very worth going to. Uh, we were on a tour and therefore we were stuck in, in what they had us doing. We came within a half a mile of that. And instead we went to a darned rock shop to try and sell the tourists expensive rock artwork. It was a little bit disoriented. Um, we got, uh, when we went to Ephesus, we asked for kind of the lower hotel options. And where all the tourists go on the coastline was apparently booked. So they sent us to a little town of Seljuk, which is even closer to Ephesus, but it's, it's a backwater where nobody goes very often. We found so many things there and had so much fun there that it was better, it was as good as, as the normal tour. That's where we found the tomb of St. John, which is an interesting question when you learn from modern revelation that John didn't die. Well, the picture here is a tomb that Christians go to worship where he died. It's, it's a rather elaborate place in this little town of Seljuk where we just took a stroll from our little hotel and uh, the tour guide didn't have it in the schedule. We weren't going to go there, but we got that. We got the castle up on the hill. That's where I found the Turkish bath. It was a good experience, and it was towards the end of Ramadan, and so there was a lot of uh, people eating in the streets as the sun went down. It was a memory that we used to really get a kick out of in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, so that was kind of fun. If you hang near the tourist hotels, you'll be treated like a tourist. You want local flavor? Uh, you go a little bit deeper. And I think local flavor getting you in your face a little bit makes most of these places more fun. So that's kind of where we started. And that's what I had to offer. It's a fun part of the world. Does anyone wish to volunteer things about the way they travel that has brought new insights or opened up new opportunities that might be helpful to others when they travel? Man, I think you can just go ahead and make a comment. Kirk unmuted us finally, I think, right? Anyway, my first suggestion when you travel somewhere, anywhere, is know a little bit of the language. Sure, you can expect everybody to speak English, and they'll probably prefer that because they know you don't speak the real language. But if you start by saying, 
hello, how are you? My name is, how, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're impressed that you took the time to learn a little bit about them before you came there. At least that's how I've always felt in France <laughs> and Spain and German, Germany, the whole thing. So that's what I try to do before I go. Especially, especially those basic greetings. How much? Mm -hmm. Where are the bathrooms? Yeah. Bathroom and thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a little twisted up with languages and it's it's interesting. Uh, English works generally if you have some patience, but in many places it doesn't work well enough to get out of a pinch. Uh, one example of that will be in the newsletter that I sent in last night. Yeah. And please do not just speak into your phone and then turn the phone around to the other person and let him speak. I'm mean, sure you'll be understood, but you won't be appreciated, I think. Anyway, so that's me. Anybody found ways to save money in a consistent way as you travel? First, Paul has a question about how, what kind of uh, money do you use? Do you use cards, do you use cash, do you use, what is the best way to travel to all those places? Well, the, the interesting thing of what we did is whenever you're in the Eurozone, you feel comfortable because you, you know the exchange rate and you've got some in your pocket. Um, we went to Budapest, which is not in the Eurozone, on a Sunday morning looking for church. And the only way we were going to make church is if we got on a metro real quick. And uh, there are a lot of areas where you can literally tap your credit card in the turnstile. Brussels was that way. Uh, in Budapest, we had to tap the credit card onto a ticket machine and get a ticket and then get on the train. And then a 99 cent charge popped up a couple of days later. Uh, so having a card is a necessity for someone like me who likes cash and Marie would laugh at me all the time. Uh, if you're only going to be a short time, like a day trip to a country, you don't want to change a whole lot of money. You, you really get gouged when you change money. But I found everywhere I did use a card, um, the exchange rate was reasonable. And as long as your credit union knows you're using it, so they don't think it's fraud, I used the card very heavily in Poland and Israel. I never used it in Turkey, and I don't think I used it in Greece. I'm just not quite as confident of uh, kind of using it on the on the street for little stuff so we had local money for that thanks if you're going to be in a place more than a couple of days i find it's a lot funner to use local money it adds to the experience to not use your credit card all over the place yeah it gives you a souvenir too I'm a coin collector. <laughs> Plus, it helps you be agile with your mental math. Our last foreign travel, because Mark and I, Mark specifically was holding all the, the local money, got opened up venues where people were friendly with us. Shopkeepers were in what, what were regular shops i mean we'd gone into like a drugstore or something but they were just excited that we wanted to interact and when mark knew exactly what he was doing with the money they were all impressed that we were not that we'd made we'd made the effort to figure out what they were doing yeah and that's another thing if you're in the tourist areas even if the country doesn't use euro they might ask you to pay in euro because they know they can gouge you a little extra you get in the normal parts of a town where they really don't think in euros and they think in just the local context. That's where you can have a more immersive experience and get away, you get, get a better price for things. And they do appreciate it. Has ever, anybody ever go, oh, this is, it's all Greek to me. Notice how different these two alphabets are. 
I mean, just the style of writing changes that so much. A triangle up above looks like it. Loopy six down below. I'm impressed by anybody who can make sense of that. We could talk about Jerusalem and have a very similar, interesting conversation. Anybody ever gone on a trip just on YouTube? We once thought about a weekend in Ethiopia and we decided, you know, it really doesn't make sense, but let's have an Ethiopia weekend. And you can plan and think it through and find restaurants and YouTube major sites with no jet lag or money spent. <laughs> you can have a whole lot of fun. And there's, there's a lot out there. And that's not a bad idea in preparing to go somewhere is to see what others have done. Because there are, there are some places, once you've done that, there are some places where one glance at it, you can go, okay, I've, I've seen that, that's all I needed. Now let's go deeper and see something else. So one other question, what are the blue domes in Santorini? Um, they tend to be churches. Some are just nicely done homes. But mainly, that one on the upper left, you can see a cross on it. It takes some work to keep them painted properly. And even the whitewashing. People are out there mopping their roofs, keeping nice. But this kind of architecture is, is kind of one sliver of the island. There's a lot of it that's, that's rather undeveloped. But there's enough there that you can spend a few days and find the fun stuff. I like the idea that Dan says they had a four-wheeler. If you've got mobility, a lot of things open up that otherwise aren't available, especially if the weather's hot. So Alf, uh, is that uh, canal between Athens and uh, uh, Sparta? Uh, does that go uh, ocean to ocean? I believe so, yes. In fact, that's why Corinth is, uh, their economy was largely based on that geographic location. Yeah, that is that is the classic definition of an isthmus right there. Uh, that's where the that's the, where the word actually comes from. Well, the uh, antiquities of Corinth were a little hard to get to without a vehicle, and we didn't have the time to pay the tour. So we literally took a train over to see the canal, which is about a one second experience as you go over the canal. It was, it was cool. <laughs> Really pretty cool. So I guess that was it. Very good. Traveling is fun. So who's been to Greece? Shannon. Shannon's been. Yeah. Who's been to Jerusalem? That's another place that is uh, very walkable, very memorable and diverse, but also not weird in the sense that, can I, can I handle the food and that sort of thing? It's fun to spend shekels, but if you're a coin collector, they don't put dates on their shekels. That's kind of a pain. <laughs> well, I'm just curious, where's this place where it was so weird you couldn't handle the food? Um, every, place, every place you've said is, oh, no, you should be able to handle it. But this leads me to believe you've been somewhere where you wouldn't think we could handle it. Um, the Philippines can be a little weird. Maybe Sarah could tell us about that. I haven't been to China, but the Chinese influence, I mean, when, when you have a buffet that has monkey brains in it, you kind of think twice. Just just knowing that's not on the buffet is kind of useful. Japan now and again, there's going to be some seafood that you probably kind of want to step back from. Oh. Uh, yeah, Sarah, did off. you eat gross things in the Philippines? <laughs> oh, I sure did. 
Some knowingly, some unknowingly. <laughs> uh, like balut? I did. I did eat balut, but I didn't know that I was doing it. We were prepared. It was, yeah. My Filipino companions loved it. So me and this other American, we we decided to try it one night and it was it was a an experience. I only did it once and I don't have any interest in doing it again. What is so it? It's the it's the duck egg. When you drink, you like drink the juice and then anyway, depending on how many days the duck egg has been fertilized, you can see different parts of the duck, like it's forming more. So some people like it more longer and anyway so they but they love it there's people that ride around on their bicycles with their little styrofoam cartons and they and they honk their horn and they say balut and then people just come out of their houses and buy the balut off from the man on the bike that carries it in a styrofoam case every <laughs> single night all over these balut bikes go around I don't know. Maybe if you would go to a Greek wedding, you'd find some things on the buffet that would be a little concerning. Probably. Like the Arab world, you, you see a whole camel or something. You kind of <laughs> not ready to enjoy that. Uh, one way when Dan and I have traveled, we've saved money. We have started sharing one meal. We'll just get one appetite or one big entree. That's one way that we have saved meals or will or saved money, or we will do like an appetizer and then an entree instead of two entrees. So we get to try something, but then we end up finishing it because you never take your leftovers when you're in a hotel or anything. So that was one money saving thing I did think of that we have tried on our trips. And the other one, I think booking the major tickets. Uh, like plane tickets in advance helps, but sometimes you can get a cheaper deal on like ferries or other small tours if you talk to the locals or talk to the hotel workers who know different things rather than booking a trip advisor trip or tour for the day, you ask the hotel workers at the hotel and there usually is a workaround or somebody's uncle that takes boat tours or something that we've been able to find cheaper deals by like Eric was saying, I mean, talking to locals and getting getting their their thoughts and ideas. Uh, with Dan's trips that I've joined him on, we're not always, we don't always know <laughs> a ton in advance. So I'm not able to plan as much as I would like to sometimes, but I think that's been the workaround that we've figured out of not booking these major tours ahead of time, but asking once we get there and what do the locals recommend you eat? Where do they recommend? But anyway, those are some money saving things and things we've done too. But the Philippines is a good place to go to too. Other, there are a few weird foods. Just ask what you're eating before you eat it. But <laughs> oh yeah, I think the Philippines has all kinds of historical and tour potential. And yeah, it's there's American history there too. People forget that Pearl Harbor hit Manila as well. That same day was when MacArthur was yeah acting yeah. in the same onslaught. So Alf, I, I'd appreciate it if you'd give me just sort of a general idea of how you handled uh, the allocation of cost between you and the kids. Because when you go for uh, yeah, the wife and, and yourself, that's one thing. But when you've got uh, a dozen people, or in our case, 19 people, uh, uh, then uh, it, it, you know, the, the money can get uh, pretty big pretty fast. So in your case, kind of how did you uh, allocate that back and forth between mom and dad? And the kids so i've got kids that push back a little bit when i try and pay for too much so in this case what i said is when we are all together i'll pay for the hotel or the transfer to the airport and uh i didn't pay for any flights or anybody else but the the greece hotels i just gave marie enough to cover and, and she's a careful shopper so she had got the deals down and everybody would have paid and they, oh, Papa, thank you. Oh, really? But I just thought it would be easier on everybody's budget. So in, in Athens and the islands, I paid hotels and rides back and forth to airports and ferries. Okay, and so everybody was on their own as far as transportation to and from, 
and then lights uh, were on their own and, and food was all on their and, own and food uh, uh, in uh, destination they were on their own correct and uh, then tickets to venues uh, I think it's better on your own because then people think a little harder about whether they really want to go there yeah. unless somebody's wavering you think wait a minute you can't come here and not see that then you <laughs> might want to put over the money and say I'm going to make this free for everybody so that nobody will miss the experience. Yeah. Well, uh, I will share one thing that's worked for Shannon and myself. And that is, uh, we found in the places uh, that uh, we've gone, the absolute cheapest souvenir is oftentimes a uh, placemat. And pretty much anywhere around the world, uh, you can find a pretty picture that's the size of uh, what you put on, on your. Uh, table to, to dine on and it's laminated and you pay about maybe five bucks maybe if you're in a really uh, touristy place maybe ten bucks but you bring those home and we have a whole drawer now of dozens and dozens of these placemats and it's really fun because uh, you just go through and say okay so where do you like to go today and uh, you remember the fun places that you went based on the placemats that you then uh, use uh, as, as you dine around your dining room table <laughs> Sarah is a very, very bright young lady. <laughs> we, we, we did that. In, we did that in Dubai when we were there, and and then we found these in Santorini, and we're like, that would be fun. We like our ones from Dubai, so we'll get ones at Santorini too. So we didn't necessarily look for them, but I think after getting the Santorini ones, because we use them often, I think we will start doing that more often. But. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that tip. That's been a fun thing for us too. Al, thank you so much. I appreciate all the effort you put into that uh, presentation. Absolutely. Did you happen to get to uh, anything family history wise? Not that I'm recalling. Yeah, you went to places that Brian did you, get, had did you go through Salzburg? Oh, yeah. Okay. But I didn't get to the addresses. So oh, okay. this, this is again kind of the way we travel. Salzburg was not a destination so much as a pass-through city. And we had all our luggage. There wasn't going to be any place to put it. It was when we crossed, you, you crossed that little bridge out of Germany into Salzburg you're, you see that river you go <laughs> I got to spend some hours here this isn't just to get off and look a little bit this is a walk around for a while place no question so that got limited time but it was very quality time with backpacks hauled around nice. you know, we did go to Mozart's birthplace there you go well that's, uh, I know we've had some conversations. Uh, Kirk's had some conversations about future family history kind of things. I think that would be interesting to consider. Well, I, I will say along those lines, Dave, that of the places I've been that I've enjoyed the most, they've been where there's been the touristy part and the family history part. So one of my all-time favorites was the three weeks that mom and dad and I spent in New Zealand where we were just bumming around in the, the footsteps of Johnny from Magleby. And that was an amazing trip. That's one of my all time uh, uh, favorites. And then uh, when we took the Magleby tour, Dorothy was on this one with us. We took the Magleby tour to Denmark. And that was an amazing experience to go uh, with just a bunch of our cousins and so forth and, and bum around. And then when we, we went up to uh, Norway, uh, we went up north uh, to Trondheim and that's where uh, Hans Olsen Magleby taught the family uh, of Johnny Widso. And that's been a meaningful experience for me ever since because you run into Johnny Widso all the time when you're doing uh, historical research in the church. And our guy was right up there teaching him in that little town. And so it was fun to go to that town. And so um, if, if you can uh, connect family history with travel, think of how much fun we had at Mark and Kim's house when he took the bus down to Thatcher. I mean, that was that was one of the, the real uh, choice uh, reunions that we've had as family because we were mixing the travel with the family history. So 
I highly recommend that. And uh, I'm, I'm getting interested, for instance, in Wales right now. I've never been there, uh, but I'm starting to, to do enough family history and poking around in that part of the world that uh, the desire is rising in me to go see where some of our people are from. Well, this family has been to some amazing places. We've got a lot of this world covered uh, with the group, so we'll look for more. I'm going to say a prayer and uh, formally end our evening and then stick around for some visiting if people are interested. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this amazing earth grateful for opportunities to see and experience and uh, the combined experiences of this group with the uh, capacity to uh, enjoy and recreate as well as do good around this world. We pray that that might continue, that uh, individuals will be able to see and experience and bring about uh, good throughout this world in the things we're able to do and continue to accomplish. We love thee and thank thee for uh, the safe return of Alf and his family, as well as others who have uh, been here and there and pray that that might continue, that we can appreciate, enjoy uh, safely, this world and what it has to offer and ask for these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So what did you say? This, this uh, the... Well, John, where are you going next? Um, piece of land between Athens and Corinth. Well, I plan on coming down to Arizona. Oh, that's cool. And, that's really worth it. and I, it's hot, but, actually. Yeah, I have a trip planned for Washington in October. And I'm hoping to see some of the mountains up there and maybe hit the coast a little bit. Kind of on your own? Well, Larry lives up there and he's doing the research for me and finding the good spots to go. Cool. I've been thinking about Washington because Come Follow Me this week has reference to a talk by Sister Eubanks. It talks about the men on the rowing team who were so in sync as they rowed that the boat went faster. And I grabbed that book in the library. It's kind of cool. University of Washington. The main place I want to still go in on the earth is Antarctica. I just don't want, I don't need to see the southern half of Chile or southern part of Chile or Argentina. I don't want to go there. I want to go to Antarctica. So we'll see one of these days. Maybe after I die, I'll just <laughs> sail over it. Who knows? <laughs> I'd be much more impressed with southern Chile. I wouldn't. I'll bet they have some options just for flying over it from a distance. You got enough money, you can get anything you want. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I will say uh, that one of the most unique experiences we've ever had was to go to the Galapagos with National Geographic. And uh, you pay probably double what you would for a normal travel experience just because of the National Geographic name. But what that gives you is an incredible bunch of traveling companions. So you're uh, on uh, your experience with nuclear physicists and with emeritus professors and with uh, 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 thoracic surgeons and just some of the most interesting people on the planet. So if you ever have a chance and you want to splurge, of course, it, it, it helps to go to somewhere really uh, naturalistic, kind of like the Galapagos Islands. Uh, but uh, that's an amazing experience to go with uh, National yeah, Geographic.
Bri, can you remind me how long you were in Greece? And uh, we were wondering how you got up to that monastery. Uh, we were there for two years, just under two years. And they've chiseled a, a stone, they've chiseled a stairway into the side of the mountain. It used to be just a uh, rope and basket in Whoa. the early days. But for the tourists, they've chiseled in a, a walkway so you can park and walk right up to it. So if you look close at the side of the mountain, you can kind of see a little opening where it's a little tunnel they've kind of made into the rock. So I think uh, the one in the picture is probably the one that was